And we're live in five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again on this uh, Cerebro Vascular Questions and Answers that we have uh, bi-weekly. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you all last year where we completed uh, around 24 sessions with more than an accumulative number of 40,000 views uh, with multiple speakers. We're starting this new year with uh, Dr. Peter Kahn. It's a real pleasure to have you. Dr. Kahn is the professor and uh, Robert L. Moody is Sir Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and Jenny Seeley, Distinguished Chair in Neuroscience at the University of Texas Medical Branch. He did the neurosurgical residency at the University of Utah, where he also completed the Masters of Public Health. He became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada prior to starting his uh, fellowship at Buffalo. After fellowship, he joined the University of South Florida as a director of cerebrovascular and endovascular neurosurgery. Then he was recruited by Baylor College of Medicine as an associate professor and director of cerebrovascular again. His research includes uh, new neuroendovascular devices, intravascular imaging, neuroprotection for stroke, intra-arterial cell-based therapy for malignant uh, brain tumors. He's board certified by the American Board and Canadian Board. Uh, he's very prolific in uh, academics and educational activities. So it's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Khan, here uh, as of the first speaker of the year. Thank you very much. And you can share your screen. Um, can you guys, uh, let's see here. Um, just want to make sure. Can you can you guys see my screen? Okay. Uh, not yet. Not, not yet. Sure yet. Not yet. Let me see here. Uh, how about now? There we go. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. perfect. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for Dr. McDougall and also for Dr. Costa for the um, kind invitation. Happy New Year! I guess glad to be the first speaker of the year. Um, so today I thought I would talk a uh, uh, little bit about a um, interesting topic: uh, carotid cavernous fistula. Really, um, from a like bit of a historic perspective to the current treatment is some of the kind of more novel hybrid approaches we have used for a few interesting cases. And I think this kind of highlights well in terms of the evolution and innovation in endovascular therapy in general also. So these are my disclosures, none of which is relevant to the discussion today. Um, so I thought I would start uh, by talking a little bit about the presentation and classification of carotid cavernous fistula then kind of move on to the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. Uh, apart from it being an interesting topic, I also think this is critical uh, to understand uh, in, the, in the treatment planning of these, of these lesions. Uh, a little bit of a historic vignette about what we did in the past, uh, what we do currently now, and also you know, some of the kind of newer approaches in terms of how we maybe can think of these lesions going forward. So um, as we know, uh, the classic triad of this disease is, is proptosis, chemosis, and, and visual loss. And if left untreated, you know, it can progress to ophthalmoplegia, it can progress to loss of visions. And yes, you can even die from this, uh, um, you know, often thought of as a benign disease. I mean, people do get subarachnoid hemorrhage, strokes, or even I think very rarely fatal ep epistaxis from it. So uh, the problem, of course, as we know, is the, is the shunting and the venous hypertension in the cavernous sinus. Um, so why, you know, so why is that shunting? Why, why is that shunting in the cavernous sinus? So this is the barrel classification. I think that outlines that nicely. So there are kind of, um, different scenarios, but all of them involve the carotid arteries, you know, so in the type A fistula, there's shunting because there's a hole in the ICA, basically causing high flow shunting, uh, and high flow fistulas and type B, C, and D, these are low, low flow fistulas really from meningeal collect, uh, uh, connections between either the internal carotid artery, like in type B, external carotid type C, or in both um, uh, the type D to the cavernous sinus. So a little bit more into the type A, you know, most common uh, probably causes from high-speed trauma, uh, but very rarely I've seen it once or twice from a ruptured cavernous aneurysm, and often these patients have colonic vascular disorders. And, um, and uh, perhaps the most uh, common atrogenic cause is from uh, transnodal surgery, from, from, uh, from pituitary surgery, uh, from pituitary tumor resections. So uh, 
a six special angiogram is the gold standard for the workup. And I just want to point out some different features, different things to look for for the, for the direct and direct fistula. Since for direct fistulas, you want to think about protecting the carotid or potentially sacrificing the vessel. So often I, I you know, I, I, I suggest the trainees to pay attention to, to how complete the circle will assist and also to really understand where the hole in the carotid is. And of course, in either direct or direct fistulas, you have to understand the venous range of the canvas lines to treat them. So for the indirect fistulas, again, six vessel angiograms and pay more attention in this case to the ECAs because often either through the accessory meningeal or the middle meningeal, uh, you have supply uh, to, these, to these fistulas, you know. And of course, like we discussed previously, that the venous drainage is uh, key to the, to the treatment. So um, really, I think the concept of the treatment is, is fairly simple. You basically have to block off or coil off or, or obliterate the, uh, the cavernous sinus at the point of the fistularization. The difficulty often is the execution of this. This is not sometimes not so tricky. Uh, it's sometimes a bit tricky, as we'll see in some of the example cases that we'll show. Um, but before that, we have to really understand the cavernous sinus if we want to kind of get to it. So the cavernous sinus uh, is on either side of the sphenoid bone. Um, and and actually, um, rather than, than it being just a continuous uh, venous pocket, as often shown in, 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 in textbook drawings, it's actually like a fairly complex trabeculated network in most, in most cases. Uh, they're connected medially um, through the circular sinus. You see the circular venous structure here. And um, this is why people have epistaxis. You know, the pterygoid uh, plexus in the nasal cavity is, a, is an outflow you know, of the cavernous sinus through the femoral valley. Um, but in terms of access, I think this is where the, the, the important anatomy begins from the craniofacial vein. So the superior family vein is often an excellent route to access the cavernous sinus as depicted here. The inferior family vein, although smaller, uh, but often, you know, uh, it's not a bad route too to get to the cavernous sinus posteriorly. And of course, these two veins joins at the orbital uh, apex right, right before entering the cavernous sinus. Um, the superior family vein, you can get to it with direct access, as we'll show some cases later, uh, but also you can get to endovascularly, you know, through um, the, uh, um, the internal jugular vein, uh, through the angular vein here, you can see which connects the um, um, anterior facial vein to the superior family vein. Just for completion's sake, we'll also show the posterior facial vein, also known as the retromandibular vein. On the deep facial vein that con connects the pterygoid plexus to the anterior facial vein. Now uh, we talk about the SOV, the IOV um, as uh, as routes, you know, to the to the uh, uh, cavernous sinus. Uh, there are other excellent routes. The superior pectoral sinus is a good one. You know, through a transsigmoid junction, transvenously you can get to the cavernous sinus. And perhaps a workhorse, the one that I think I and most people try first is the inferior pectoral sinus. So this is the one that we use for. Patrol sinus sampling, and I think it's excellent, usually the first, the first line approach to the cavernous sinus here. And uh, finally, the sphenoparotal sinus, something that we see from a cranial uh, approach uh, frequently also drains in the cavernous sinus. And uh, we can think about kind of accessing the sphenoparotal sinus through, through sylvian veins, in this case, a superficial middle cerebral vein. So through the superficial middle cerebral vein, sphenoparotal sinus can also get to the cavernous sinus. So a little bit about uh, the historic vignette. Um, so originally, as you would suspect, since these are all ophthalmologic presentations, the main ophthalmologic presentations that are thought to be a disease of the orbit. Uh, and Benjamin Travis, a British um, a surgeon, was the first to try to tackle this, this disease. And, and I think it's an important first step, but he was trying to do kind of proximal ligation and proximal occlusion type of approach. So he found that proximal compression helps. And he actually, with anesthesia, did the first carotid ligation for this disease and find that it helps alleviate the, uh, the symptoms. Uh, of course, later on in autopsies, people realized that the disease is actually intracranial and it's not in the, in the orbit. Um, but without kind of cranial approaches, they're really limited to, you know, as you can see here, to still only kind of carotid uh, compression which you kind of still talk about in textbooks these days, using kind of the, the uh, contralateral hand to compress the carotid. So I think the next big leap comes from Walter Dendy, you know, so uh, he, um, you know, with craniotomies and clipping of aneurysms uh, at, at Hopkins, he, he realized that he can trap these, these uh, fistulas, you know, so apart from just putting a clip on or, or tying off the carotid in the neck, 
you can also kind of tie up the carotid distally, uh, distal to the rent or the hole in the carotid, uh, intracranially proximal to the posterior communicating artery. Of course, this works quite well for the direct fistulas, unless if you do not have a circle willis, and then you you have a stroke. So, so this comes with a you know uh, with a significant um, uh, problem, uh, especially when you when you don't do test occlusions and you don't understand the the uh, collaterals at the at the time. So the next leap. Uh, after kind of proximal uh, ligation and, and trapping is really uh, from a Canadian Canadian hero neurosurgeon Dwight Parkinson who who pioneered a lot of the approaches and anatomy of the cavernous sinus. So so really this is the first time that we try to have a carotid preservation and cranial preservation approach. And these approaches is the same. Essentially, you try to find a point of fistulization and you're trying to occlude it with direct surgical approaches uh, and techniques. And here it shows the Parkinson's triangle between the third and the fourth nerve here. Um, the problem is that a lot of these were done with hypothermic cardiac arrest with lots of kind of blood loss, coagulopathy. So that 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 kind of complex approaches pushes the, the endovascular side to really uh, improve it. As I always say, you know, necessity is the, is the mother of all inventions. So um, so there are a few few groups uh, uh, working on it. Uh, the Brune uh, uh, and the colleagues in London, Ontario, and France have have kind of kind of shown a, a a good series of success, kind of floating balloons transvenously through the inferior patrol sinus to the cavernous sinus to treat these fistulas. And of course, the credit of the balloon goes to to the uh, um, previous Soviet uh, interventionist uh, Serbenenko, who kind of really pioneered this 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 technique for um, uh, using to to really treat fistulas. Uh, of course, when we do this uh, balloon transarterially, the risk is from um, from embolic risk. You know, it doesn't often or always goes to the the point where you need to. Sometimes it can embolize distally beyond beyond the carotid and causing causing strokes. So. So this is where we're today. We prefer to use coils, you know, compared to balloons, of course, we can develop, uh, so we can deliver the coils uh, much more precisely. Uh, we, can de de uh, we can deploy them through kind of small uh, micro catheters. And also they're soft and, and, and they can displace the cranial nerves and, and doesn't really cause damage to the contents of the cavernous sinus. Um, so we can kind of, uh, do the coiling uh, either transarterial or transvenously, and I'll show examples of both. And I think that's an important technical point that when you close these fistulas and camera sinus, uh, I, I I really try hard to to close the um, the origin of the outflow veins too, because if you don't do that and you don't close the fistulas, often you can exacerbate the symptoms or the risk of hemorrhage for the patients. So uh, another way to, to embolize and to close the cavernous sinus is uh, with liquid embolic, either uh, onyx or MBC, other, other liquids. Uh, I think there, you know, in general, people use coils first. I think there's some, some uh, reported literature of you know, perhaps a higher array of craniopathy or liquid. I'm not, not really sure if that's truly panned out. And of course, there's also the concern of retrograde um, uh, embolization, whether, whether it be through kind of tiny meningeal branches, or actually if you have a hole in the carotid, that's even much more concerning. So I think most of us would, would tend to go to coils first if, if that's a, that's a possibility. So uh, what are the outcomes of, of um, embolization? The outcomes are excellent. So here is a, ser is a meta-analysis um, by, um, by Kenwell and an associate on almost 1600 cases. And you've looked at it, you know, in the different types of fistula, different approaches, you're talking about almost a 90% chance of com complete cure uh, of these patients. And, and these are truly kind of gratifying patients and gratifying cases. So just uh, one slide on radio surgery. Uh, I've never done it, but I think uh, the literature is out there. And uh, in my mind, probably the last uh, the last resort, you know, uh, as you can see here, you can deliver radiation uh, to the fistulas and it does take time like in AVMs for this to work. And of course, like anything else, it does have uh, recurrence and potential complications uh, like cross gnosis after radiation or, or, or malignant uh, um, uh, tumors development after radiation. So uh, I prepare uh, in the next, uh, in the next, um, 40 minutes or so, uh, a, uh, a dozen cases that kind of illustrates uh, the 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 uh, uh, the points that we that we talked about. So, this is a recent patient, a 24 year old patient, uh, uh, high speed MBA two years ago, presented with chemosis. And just by looking at history and uh, the title of the talk, we know that this patient has a uh, type A high flow um, um, CC fistula. So. I uh, just want to show the angiogram and, and I'll pause them for the audience to point out some salient features. So this is the lateral angiogram and the AP. I think uh, what I tell kind of like the students and the junior resident that 
when you see the angiogram, it always looks kind of scary to the to the people who haven't seen this, you know. And I think if you see this kind of scary angiograms, and then we tell you CC fistula is a direct fistula, it looks scary because often the blood is shunted uh, entirely to the to the venous side of it, so you don't see like great MCA filling, and you see all the blood on the counter sinus. Everything looks dilated. I think on the left side here is good to look at the outflow. So we talk about the things that we look for for the direct fistula. So you can see here, there's the superior thalamic vein the angular vein and the anterior facial vein. There's the inferior thalamic vein here. There's a superior petrosal sinus. Then there's inferior petrosal sinus here uh, going to the jugular vein. So again, study the, the, the routes of the, uh, of the exit of the cavernous sinus. And then here just shows a lack of perfusion here. And of course, for the direct fistula, we should study the, the collateral. So here you can see it's an injection of the um, left ICA, you know, really showing excellent cross filling and really no delay in perfusing uh, uh, the right hemisphere, relatively speaking, to a left side, even out to the venous venous face here. And here, when you inject it for T bar artery here, you can see um, an excellent uh, PCOM. So you know this patient has a great circle of Willis, and he passed it the uh, the balloon test occlusion with no with no difficulty. So. Um, so uh, in general, in younger people, I, I prefer to preserve the carotid, but just for illustration's sake here, like I pick a case here that we actually did the carotid sacrifice. So here, uh, option, uh, like our plan was to sacrifice the carotid since the patient with excellent circle will is then we tolerate carotid sacrifice. So here, um, the point I try to make uh, on this particular case that when you sacrifice a carotid, you have to really trap the, the whole both proximal and distally because if you don't trap the carotid distally, then you can retrograde fill the fistula and then making the treatment, of course, even more, more difficult like at that point. So here you can see the hole in the fistula is in the posterior uh, genu um, of the carotid. And then, um, you know, we have coils both proximal and distally. And um, here is the final result here. Um, no more uh, enterograde flow into the carotid on both the AP and the uh, lateral. And at this point, you always want to assess the uh, collaterals here uh, to make sure that uh, that you have good cross filling and there's no thing on the fistula, which is which is the case which is the case here. Okay, so this is uh, case one. So we'll move on to the next case. So the next case, again, a classic uh, example, but you can see the demographics, right? The first one, younger male, MVA, so a high flow fistula. This is the classic indirect low flow fistula, an older female, red eye. Um, Diplopia, high intraocular pressure, often mistaken for glaucoma, and have all the other cardinal signs, proptosis, chemosis, and uh, kind of limited extraocular movements. So this is a CT scan and show often, you know, you can see the dilated superior alvamic vein here on the on, on the CT that, that can clue you in. And um, and then even on the MRI, I think you can see here, there is some, some suggestion that there is shunting connection between the, the, uh, the camera sinus and the, and the artery. And the, the diagnosis is clinch on the angiogram. This is a left ICA injection. And you can see here, there's um, cavernous uh, uh, connection, probably through the mini cup of seal trunk um, to the, to the, um, uh, the cavernous sinus and the drainage is, is retrograde through the superior thalamic vein. Uh, angular vein uh, and down to the anterior facial vein. In this case, I actually try to go purely in the vascular through the angular vein. I just can't quite negotiate that turn uh, and, and was short. So we uh, did this case uh, with the oculoplastics colleague. Um, here we have, uh, this is the, a cut on the uh, on the top of the of the superior lid. And here, uh, fairly straightforward, I think I can get you this exposure in a matter of 15 minutes or so. Here, a vessel loop along the superior thalamic vein uh, I just used the micropuncture kit and the dilator to, to get access to it. Uh, important to see arterial blood once you puncture it to make sure that you're in the right spot. And then I just uh, basically have a micro um, uh, dilator set up and I place a micro catheter through this directly in the cavernous sinus. You can see this is a venogram of the cavernous sinus to confirm that we're in the, in the proper position. And then we just coiled off the part that fistula arises. And again, I, I always try to take take off the the at least the origin of the of the superior vein vein too. So just make sure that if I didn't get the fistula completely, that this 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 could not um, this could not uh, kind of uh, exacerbate like the symptoms. And this is the final run here, uh, really showing no more uh, no more uh, shunting, uh, and the patient did uh, did well from the procedure. So uh, just say uh, kind of like a, a companion point. So um, a lot of people actually don't 
use oculoplastics or an ophthalmology to do the cut down. A lot of people either do ultrasound, which I think you can get, uh, like in this case, um, or you can just use a roadmap. Like the vein is pretty obvious on biplane roadmap, you can puncture it. My, my um, bias is to use oculoplastics. I, I think it's always nice for a collaborative team for these. And also I think once in a while, if you get in trouble with bleeding in the orbit, if you lacerate this vein or, or whatever you need, a canthotomy, they're right there. You don't have to kind of call them on an immersion basis. I think that's that's been, been helpful. Okay, so the next case here, uh, again, uh, very familiar picture to all the all the audience now, this scary picture of the direct kind of high flow CC fistula. I just want to show this case to show the other route to the superior valmic vein which is in this case through the anterior facial vein and the, and the angular vein uh, and the angular vein here. So here again, uh, through the supravalent vein, navigating into the cavernous sinus here, the microwire dropping into the cavernous sinus and uh, noticing where the hole in the carotid is. And uh, in this case, I use a balloon uh, to occlude the carotid patient excellent circle. Was, so I just left the balloon up during the coiling. And this is some kind of fast speed uh, coiling of the cavernous sinus, as you can see here, with a balloon inflated in the carotid. Uh, we just did transvenous uh, coiling. And then this is the uh, final run showing that the carotid is preserved and, and, the, uh, and the fistula is uh, closed. Okay, so again, a familiar picture of a direct CC fistula here. I want to show this case uh, one. Uh, so here, uh, again, direct CC fistula, uh, a balloon in the carotid artery, understanding where the, where the, um, uh, where the uh, problem is, uh, and also uh, protecting, uh, and also as a protection of the carotid. So I, I'm going to show this case for two reasons. One is the different access to the cavernous sinus. So here we have a approach for the superior petrosal vein. So here I have two, two catheters, um, two catheter technique to go from the uh, superior petrosal sinus into the cavernous sinus. Meanwhile, I have a carotid, uh, meanwhile, I have a balloon here spanning the posterior genu uh, and, uh, and an inflated under coiling. But this is sometimes the reality of it. So here, after like many, many coils in the cavernous sinus, the fissure still fills. So sometimes it's not always possible to cure it this way. And I even put more coils in, it still fills and fills and fills. And ultimately I had to sacrifice the, the carotid. So sometimes, so this I think is a nice companion case for the first um, uh, few cases. So sometimes, despite the fact that, you know, you try to preserve the carotid, it's not always possible. In this case, I end up sacrificing carotid, which I probably could have done in the in the first place, but probably worth a try. Um, so again, here, the same pictures, uh, the collateralization shows that this patient is supplying the right hemisphere fine after the carotid sacrifice. Um, <laughs> Next case, so, so a bit of a different case. Uh, so now we don't see any filling of the fistula through the um, internal carotid artery. And here you see it filling through the external carotid artery. Again, seeing the filling of a cavernous sinus, the outflow to the superior ophthalmic vein, to the angular vein, and now to the anterior facial vein. So here, I just wanna show this another different route. This is probably my, my first route for all cases, uh, the inferior petrosal sinus. So here you can see left inferior petrosal sinus, uh, microcatheter in, into the cavernous sinus. Always do a microcatheter run to show that you're the correct place. And here, just kind of coembolization of the cavernous sinus at the site of the fistularization. And basically, you just keep putting coils in until the fistula is shut down, uh, in this case, uh, and, uh, and uh, cure the fistula this way. Um, I think it's an interesting case to show. Uh, I think this is a bit of an unusual case. I think rarely you can cure these, these fistulas transarterially with liquid. I think this is a, a rare case of that. Um, so this case, if you look at the lateral uh, left ICA run carefully, you can see on the horizontal camera segment, there is fistularization to the, to the cavernous carotid. And then there is... Um, early venous drainage of cortical veins. You can even see on the lateral. And the AP is a little harder to see, so I'll skip that. And uh, really kind of go to the to the more of the uh, clear shot, which is the ECA shot here. I think ECA shot here, you can clearly see the middle meningeal here is enlarged. The distal, the distal internal maxillary is enlarged, supplying the, the fistula with cortical venous drainage. In this case here, um, let's go to the... Um, Lateral here. So in this case here, I was able to place a septic balloon in the uh, distal internal maxillary. You can see here microcatheter on showing a, it goes through part of the fistula into the cortical venous uh, um, outflow. And um, here we uh, injected onyx, and I'll show uh, under kind of balloon uh, 
occlusion, so it penetrated the fistula uh, all the way to the to the um, cortical vein there to cure the fistula. And I, I um, in general, I don't like to do that. I, I think there's often kind of um, connections, you know, especially to the ILT to the to the um, from the distal IMAX, you know, through ILT to the internal carotid, and of course to the middle meningeal. There's often or there's connection, you know, to the ophthalmic too. So I think this is a bit of an unusual case. I think usually when you do the these kind of meningeal or distal uh, ECA uh, injection. Uh, often that that you see that the artery is, is too small, is too proximal to do any any kind of curative treatment. This is just one of the interesting case that was actually able to do that and cure the fistula and um, and protected the, the the carotid this way. So uh, so that's kind of what we have done for a long time. Uh, really, the workhorse is kind of transvenous. Uh, camera sinus core mobilization. I think that's the kind of the workhorse. I think, and I think we still do that do that these days. But so, what is kind of a little bit newer since 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 then? So this is a, a interesting case I want to show. Uh, again, uh, very familiar now picture of the direct uh, carotid uh, camera fistula here. Um, in this case here, uh, rather than um, doing, you know, rather than having a balloon in the rents, like I showed in the previous cases and just go transvenous coiling. Uh, there are a few unique things about this case. First, uh, I access the venous part of it through the through the injury, um, through the uh, um, defect in the carotid. So you can see here, I kind of went to the camera sinus side all the way to the superior ophthalmic vein, um, you know, through the arterial side. And then secondly, rather than using a balloon in the carotid while well, I coil the camera sinus, in this case, I actually deploy a, a flow averter. And that's kind of how I've been doing these cases uh, um, recently. So here you can see this is a surpass evolved device being deployed uh, across the rent in the, uh, in the carotid. And I think there are some advantage of doing this. So this is the, the run immediately after the stent is deployed. You can see the flow is a lot slower already, even after one 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 device, you know. So you can clearly see now perfusion and filling of the MCA and the flow in the camera's uh, sinus is much slower. I think this is this better. It's low sound of flow. You can probably need less coils. So here I start coiling the the um, uh, the camera sinus, and then this is the final final run here, uh, showing uh, no more shunting and the and the fistula is cured uh, in this in this in this case. So I think uh, advantages of using flow inverter uh, and treating direct CC fistula, um, you know, and people with an intact cervical willis, I think putting a balloon there for the case, not a big deal, but it allows crop protection without flow arrest. I think that's one advantage. Uh, it, as you can see there, even after one stent, you get a significant, I think, flow aversion effect. And I've seen this in a few cases now. So I think you can probably use less coils if you were to, were to, were to do that. And I think finally, uh, in the long run, this gives a nice scaffold for healing of the carotid. Unlike you know, the case that I showed previously, that you just have a balloon there, you close it off, and the carotid is just basically healing overall coils. So here it has a nice stent and a nice scaffold for, for healing. Um, so in the last uh, bit of the talk, uh, I just want to talk about kind of surgeons. I think mean, these are cases that kind of really interest us. So uh, all the cases I've shown so far, the first, the first few cases, they all have an endovascular route or access either to the fistula or to the cavernous sinus. So what happened if, if, if these access don't, don't exist? So I want to talk about kind of hybrid approaches. Of course, the, the, um, the problem and the solution is not new. So this is a report from London, Ontario, uh, way over a decade ago. This is an interesting case that the only access to the cavernous sinus is really through the sphenoparous sinus uh, uh, through the superficial middle cerebral vein. So in this case here, no endovascular access. They had to do a craniotomy and then they direct puncture the, uh, essentially like the sylvian veins. And then they put a microcatheter uh, there and then the rest is, is pretty standard like we showed in that, in that case of the, of the orbital cut down. Um, so since then we've done a few kind of uh, 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 cases uh, and we published a, a few of our, of, our, of our cases. So I just wanna show, show a few of them. So. Uh, so this here, uh, I'll show this this case. So this um, this case, uh, uh, kind of a, a classic example of an elderly lady with a indirect CC fistula affecting the right eye. You can see the proptosis and the chemosis here. Uh, the CT already kind of hinting there's there's some problems in the cavernous sinus uh, on the right side. And here, a very typical uh, instrument appearance. Here you can see a contralateral kind of meningeal supply from the ICA to the to the fistula. Um, let me just, and, and here kind of, kind of meningeal supply from the contralateral, uh, ECA. And again, this is a common scenario like we talked about often the meningeal supply is too small to 
be able to get distal enough to do any kind of arterial embolization. Um, so uh, in this case, I, I just started a venous draw as I always do. So here, the right IJ, unfortunately, is occluded. So I went uh, left IJ, left IPS, and got into cavernous sinus. But unfortunately, the, the, there's no connection between the cavernous sinus and this, uh, and this uh, fistula pouch, as you can see here. So um, in this case, like a surgeon, you know, we look back at a CTA, fairly you know, reasonable access. So this is an access that we use for pituitary surgery. So here we did an endonasal endoscopic transnoidal access. And we basically took off bone on the on, on the sphenoid. And you can see here, this is the navigated uh, trajectory, or essentially after you remove the bone, you're right onto the venous pouch here. Uh, and uh, in this case here, this is the needle um, directly uh, puncturing it. And I'm just gonna show that this is a long spinal needle, um, my hand in the field getting radiated, and then the here on makes uh, injection. Uh, and then we have a, uh, a uh, radio, um, uh, angiogram in the hybrid room to basically document cure of the of the CC fistula, and um, this is a nice picture to show that the the ophthalmologic symptoms usually come down pretty quickly, and in, in the seven days, her eyes are really much much better and almost normal. Um, just want to show like a sister case that that that, that recently here uh, again. Good to illustrate the presentation. This is an interesting case. Seventy three year old woman uh, came in with kind of mild right side of weakness, and she had this kind of small. Uh, deep um, kind of kind of basal ganglia hemorrhage that I think you know has hypertension. Maybe some of us won't even get a CTA. Now I was lucky because I she came with a history. She has a CC fistula that was, that was successfully treated before in the past, so I kind of knew that maybe a vascular cause of this. So we got a CTA. You can see here, apart from the uh, fistula, you can also see there's a venous varix on the right side that was the source of the hemorrhage. So here, these are the onyx uh, from prior embolization. Uh, so very similar to the last case, right? Here we have kind of meningeal supply to the fistula from the contralateral uh, carotid and, and also the ipsilateral uh, internal carotid artery here. Um, this is the venous pharynx on the angiogram that corresponds to the site of hemorrhage. Um, and uh, again, I, I always try from the IPSS. Uh, and often in these cases, unfortunately, there's no connection. To the to the to the normal cavernous sinus to the fistula part, and um, in this case, like I actually even try out. I'll just pause this here for a second. I, I even try to go re retrograde uh, to see if I can catheterize the venous pharynx, but unfortunately, there's a very tight turn right right between Rosenthal and and the and the and the pharynx. So I just can't get into it. So you can see here, like the the catheters are just buckling. So I. So I gave up and we and we did the same thing. We went to the OR here. We just went uh, transnoidal um, uh, our second time doing this. So we use a biopsy needle. Uh, we use some very short uh, uh, tubing with very small uh, dead space. So we can, we can we, uh, and actually this tubing is very DMSO resistant. That the DMSO didn't, didn't melt the tubing and very small volume. So very small dead space for DMSO and onyx. And here we uh, again uh, navigate it. We use an axiom system. We we navigate it to the to the point here. We just did all the bony removal. And uh, here uh, again intraoperative angiogram. So we do control run showing the fistula. And uh, here we we directly uh, injected it. You can see here the puncture um, venogram here onyx injection. See like the black. The black substance coming out of the uh, of the of the needle and then the endoscopic view, and here we have the onyx onyx injection casting that that pouch. It's a little hard to control. I I, I try to stop as quickly as I can once I saw the varix, but still some of went went distally. Uh, fortunately, it didn't didn't cause any harm to the patient. Here you can see actually the onyx refluxing out of the of the needle uh, into the into the sphenoid, and um, uh, here um, of course the, the the bleeding stops once you. Uh, close the fistula here, and here is a is a run showing the the fistula is completely close. So um, he's actually even, even did a more interesting case recently. So how about if the fistula pouch is at a at a different place? So how about if the fistula pouch um, um, is um, um, behind a carotid? So so I'll show this this case here. We present. Robot. So I'll so I'll, I'll I'll do it this way so we don't we don't hear the the the, the narration. So uh, here you can see another classic example: the right eye is swollen. Is uh, and you see here the fistula is actually behind uh, the carotis, behind the posterior genu. So this one is actually 
uh, not possible to access through the sphena, like we showed in the past a uh, couple of cases. So I was kind of thinking, well, what are the options? You know, can we get started in the neovascular route? So if you look at the microcatheter run here, this is a a, a good run. I'll, uh, I'll just pause this and go back to this microcatheter run here. So you can see here, this is the isolated posterior part of the cavern of sinus. Um, you know, the, the cortical vein that comes into it has a stenosis. So there's really kind of no access to it. And uh, this is a superior vein vein that's from both. There's no um, IPS that I've, I've, I've tried to interrogate it and there's no superior parasocial sinus. So there's really no endovascular access to it. So I was even thinking about maybe doing a kind of doling kind of approach to do an extra extra dural cavernous um, approach to the cavernous sinus and maybe just directly uh, inject it once we once we navigate and, and find it. But then my 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 partner, my my functional epilepsy partner said, hey, why don't we try to directly puncture this with 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 the rosa? So um, so that's and and, and what we end up doing is this the rosa robot as we know the the system that we use to place sterile EEG in neurosurgery. Um, so here we register the the robot. If we can use any kind of stereotactic system, it's, it's the same. So this is our this is our planned trajectory. Um, we actually plan to go transtemporal. Um, so through a, a a small kind of bar hole, a small uh, small kind of parenchymal corridor, uh, directly access that 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 pouch. So here, um, this is actually an, an O arm spin. Uh, after we put the needle in, we just want to, it's the first time uh, doing it. So we just want to make sure that needle is not way off when we, before we puncture. So this is the, uh, the O-arm spin. So this is just the, the, the workflow of the, the, the Rosa robot uh, here is when we uh, drill the hole in it. And the bolt is very small. The bolt is only a seven millimeter bolt. And then here we, we, we place the needle through it. Um, and, um, and uh, confirm uh, position before we do the injection. So I'll, so I'll play the rest of this out here and there'll be the narration here too. So let's, let me just play this rest of this out here. The Chiba needle was advanced to the fistula, demonstrating clearly here with a lateral view. Under Romap guidance, the needle punctures a fistula and back bleeding was observed. So here we're directly puncturing the camera sinus through a transtemporal uh, corridor. By injecting contract. So here is our is our venogram. So we just want to make sure that we're in the right pocket with this transcranial puncture. And then this is uh, a balloon inflation in the carotid just to protect the carotid from retrograde injection. And then this is the actual uh, onyx uh, onyx injection. We can play it here. Via the Chiba needle. So here here is the is the actual uh, injection. Uh, with, with that here. And then uh, the onyx needle, I thought this is a pretty, pretty cool picture of the onyx uh, kind of coming to a needle directly through the temporal lobe. And this is the the uh, final run show that we're completely injecting and cure the, uh, the fistula. Um, so uh, just uh, one last case uh, before, um, before we uh, 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 I'll stop. Uh, so not uh, everyone who presents like this has a CC fistula. Um, there are some CC fistula mimics that we should pay attention to. And I want to show a case of an orbital fistula. So this is case uh, we can see here, same presentation, uh, left side chemosis, proptosis. And if you look at the um, the CTA, it's very interesting. You can see this is a dilated superophamic vein. And it goes to, towards the back um, to the orbital apex. And then it connects to the inferior ophthalmic vein and to the fistula. And you can see the ophthalmic artery there is, is dilated. And I'll, and I'll show the angiogram that would illustrate that a lot, a lot better. So, um, so this is the lateral magnified view here. I think it really shows the fistula well. So this is the fistula from the ophthalmic artery. So this is the ophthalmic artery going towards the, the, the fistula. And fistula rises with the inferior ophthalmic vein first, and then it drains backwards to the orbital apex. Um, I'll just pause it here. So ophthalmic artery coming out here, uh, kind of distal um, tributaries, fistularizing the inferior ophthalmic vein, going back to the orbital apex, superior ophthalmic vein, and then it goes towards the angular vein and then draining out to the to the anterior facial vein. Um, so uh, in this case, and I think also here the Dyna CT shows it very, very nicely. So this is the fistula pouch, inferior ophthalmic vein, orbital apex, the enlarged ophthalmic artery, and then a superior ophthalmic vein coming out to the ang uh, to the angular vein. So here uh, we we first attempted the uh, transvenous route. Um, 
through the uh, anterior uh, facial vein, angular vein, and the uh, superior thalamic vein. So you can see here with a microcatheter all the way to the inferior thalamic vein uh, here. Unfortunately, in this case, when we close the fistula, we actually end up missing the the critical part of it. And you can see here, this is where the where the mistake is, is, is made here. So here we we had the coil embolization, um, but the coils didn't really quite get far enough to the anterior part of the of the inferior thalamic vein. So basically, unfortunately, lock ourselves out of the access uh, without without curing the um, the fistula in this case. So uh, the only option at that point is, is really a direct puncture. So in this case here, we took the patient to the OR. So here's our setup. Uh, we used the stealth. Um, uh, hybrid OR, uh, have how uh, ophthalmology colleague make an decision on, on the on the orbital um, um, uh, uh, floor, and then we just basically navigated it uh, and directly puncture the rest of that pouch. You can see here is that this navigated puncture, we directly puncture it, we injected it, and this is the uh, venogram here uh, showing that, and then here is the. Um, actual injection showing that we were filling out that anterior pouch, but also retrograde filling some of these small branches from the ophthalmic uh, really stop pretty early uh, just so that we don't retrograde inject into the ophthalmic there. So again, a, a uh, kind of final injection showing how we completely fill that pouch and some with some retrograde injection to the distal branch branches supply to fistula. So, um, and this is the final uh, run just to show that the that the fistula is obliterated. I'll show the lateral two before the final final slide here. So uh, in summary, um, uh, endovascular therapy has really become the main um, one, two, three treatment modality for both direct and direct cardiac cannabis fistulas, whether it be coils, liquid embolics, or with flow inverters. Uh, I think fistulas, you know, patients with any, uh, I think the symptomatic fistula, either from ophthalmologic symptom or from hemorrhage, should be treated urgently. And I just want the audience to think about in some fistulas, uh, especially from our radiology and neurology colleagues, where there's no endovascular access, these hybrid approaches are actually relatively straightforward and offer, I think, an elegant and curative ways to these lesions. So uh, thanks very much uh, um, for the invitation, and I'm happy to take, take any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Gan, it was an amazing uh, lecture, really out of the box approaches to, to this pathology. Uh, I have many questions. Uh, I'm going to start with something very technical. So actually, uh, uh, not long ago, we did a, one, of these, one of these alternative approaches. It was for an AVM, actually, uh, where we punctured transcranially a, a big MMA feeder that the patient had. And the, the, main, the main problem there was fixing the, fixing the sheet. So how, what do you recommend for fixing the sheet in this alternative, for example, the SOV approaches? How do you, how do you manage? Do you use any kind of, any special length or? Yeah, so I, uh, so I think this is a little bit different from this here, right? So I, I've, so uh, for example, I noticed the, the, the problem, the problem really is a problem when we do, you know, sometimes we do those direct access to the transsigmoid fistula when you do a burr hole there and you, and you put a microcatheter in, and it's really hard to maintain the microcatheter. The microcatheter, as you know, is designed to go from the groin to the head. So basically you have 130 centimeter of wire of catheter sticking out and it's, and it's very, very floppy. So I, so I usually try to put something in there, like a, I a micro dilator, like you see in this case, so that at least there's a second fixation point on it. Um, or, um, you know, or even, or even like a small diagnostic catheter, I think sometimes it's, it's possible in certain situations. But I think in this case, you saw the direct puncture case, I just put a second point, which is a micro, um, it's just a micro dilator. And I've done it uh, here. And I've done it on the transfer signal fistulas that I just kind of tacked that down and used that and put my micro catheter through. So I think if you just put a micro catheter directly through that, it's just very difficult to, to, to secure that and to manipulate that. But I think Dr. McDougall probably has much more experience in, 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 in the answer to the question than I do. So I'd like to hear his his uh, kind of pearl on, on how to how to deal with this situation when you have these really long catheters, you know, designed to go transfemoral, and now you have more sort of hang out the the in the field. You know, how do you secure it? How do you manipulate it? And uh, well, for, first of all, Peter, that was a great presentation. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Beautiful cases. Uh, Love the robot. Uh, that was really, uh, really innovative. Um, I, I mean, the 
if you do direct puncture or any of these things, like it's, it's like you know, it's like gold. Your life depends on securing that <laughs> and not having you know you, right. you, you're three hours to get to that point, and you're uh, you know five minutes away from finishing the case. So yeah, you really want to make sure that that is is secure. And usually, uh, you know, I take a, a lure lock tubing like like uh, you know onto the onto the end of the whatever you've punctured with lock it on there, staple it onto the field uh, in a way that's secure and not going to displace the, the puncture needle and bring that way back so you're well out of the radiation and then put your two-way on there and, and, and slot, you know, you, and put the microcatheter through it all. And that way you're, you're, you never touch it again. You never go near it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, just a non-surgical question. Do you, do you indicate internment and manual, manual compression for B, Cs, and Ds? In any case, uh, some people report like thirty percent uh, closure in forty days. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, people talk in the textbooks. They always talk about like the contralateral compression, right? So yeah. you compress your carotid, you get ischemic, make the hand they kind of fall. I, I have this. I've never done it. I mean, again, I mean, Doctor McDougal is much more experienced than I do in this. I, I, I have never recommended that. I mean, it's in the textbooks. I, in fact, I have a slide on it on this talk. I thought I just hide it. I didn't show it. So <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think we're, I, my, my takes that we're, we're, we're better tools right now, but Dr. Madugo, what do you, what do you, what do you think? Um, early in my career, I recommend it to everybody because we were much more, you know, we didn't have the same tools. We didn't have the same success rate. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it was a, a, a little bit more of a, a aggressive to actually be treating the fissures at all. So I, I generally had people do it and, you know, with the with the idea that treating them if they failed and pretty much they all failed. So it was just, just sort of delayed your uh, your treatment <laughs> of the lesion. And the, the thing that, that uh, I think is always important to remember, though, is especially, you know, the frail elderly people. Um, if they're not in a lot of pain, and, and a lot of them aren't, um, there's really no urgency to treat them unless the inter, you know, the uh, intraocular pressures are high. So I, I always do like to know what the intraocular pressures are because that really determines, you know, the urgency of the treatment. And and if if it's you know an older frail person, um, and the other thing is sometimes they're, they're presenting as they, as they thrombose. So they're, so they're starting to thrombose and they get kind of angry and, and redder and some of their outflow paths are, are clotting. So sometimes they, I have seen some spontaneously cure, uh, you know, while you were waiting to, to um, tee them up to treat them. But, but knowing the intraocular pressure really drives, drives the urgency of the treatment. And, and sometimes you can wait for somebody who's not having a lot of symptoms. Okay. Well, next question is about the, complications uh, with embolic materials in the governor's sinus. Have you seen uh, cranial nerve palsies, proptosis, uh, visual, visual acuity decrease? And do you think they are permanent? They are transitory? How do you? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, you know, when I, when I started doing this, I think, I, as mentioned in talk, like I think there is some concern in the literature that maybe the liquid is, is worse than coils, but I, but personally I've, I've, I've used both and I haven't seen much of, of a, of a cranial nerve injury with liquid. I mean, Dr. Mudugo, what do you, I mean, what, are, what is your experience? Again, I'm, 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 I'm putting every question off to him because he has, he has way more, way, way more experience. I, I, was, I, I, I think, you know, all the answers and it's, that's, that's, uh, you know, very uh, nice of you to, to uh, offer it to me, but I think, you know, the answers to these, I, I mean, I, personally, I'm afraid of the onyx, you know, the, the bigger fish is where there's, where there's a, you're going to have to fill a fairly large part of the cavernous sinus. It, it frightens me. The cases you showed, I think were really appropriate uses of onyx where, where, you know, you had cortical veins, you had a difficult access, you had to cast that whole area, uh, but you just have so much more control with the coils yeah. uh, than you do with the onyx. And the, the, the real problem with onyx to me is that you very quickly lose visibility. You lose the ability to see if it's getting into the carotid or other places. So, so I, I do worry about the cranial nerves, but, but the, the visibility as, as the case progresses becomes very challenging. And if you don't get it all with the first injection, you've burned your catheter, you may have, you know, it was a difficult access and you're kind of up against it. I, I think, I think Dr. McDougall, you even, you even reported cases of SIEDH, right? With onyx. We, we did yeah that that was a kind of weird case i forget the details of it they ultimately resolved but but yeah that was that was early on and certainly uh gave us some pause about it 
but I think, but I think, I think you know, to the you know, if they're kind of uh, Chinese listening, uh, I think Dr. Miguel's point is that I think we all try to do coiling. I, I mean, coiling is always what we try to do as 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 as, as first first therapy. But I think in some cases that you know we use onyx because we have to. I mean, like that you know, in this case, some of the cases I show the onyx, you know, we can I can I can get coiling catheters and do it. But I think coiling. It's just much more controllable and much more safer in in general. For so I think transvenous coiling. I mean, take home is that transvenous coiling is really a standard approach to this to this disease. You know, for the yeah, I think that's the safest one, and that's that should be the default. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another question regarding the approaches. Uh, have you tried the uh, superior petrosal sinus? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I show a I show a case of that. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah. one one case that I show, I, I have two catheters, and that I I think so. So in general, Mateus, the way I think of this, that I usually think of transvenous coral embolization as the first approach. And I usually go through the IPS. I think that's most that's a kind of your, your lowest hanging fruit. Usually you can you can do it that way, you know. And second, the usually the second one is superophthalmic vein. You can if you can't get the IPS, you can usually get to the SOV either through the angular vein or through the rect puncture. I think that's pretty standard and pretty pretty yeah. good. I think beyond beyond those two, then you have to be a little more creative, you know. But uh, but I think yeah. those two are usually pretty good. I think. Yeah, sorry for interrupting, but but I mean superior petrosal sinus. Yeah, I, I mean I show. Yeah, I show case. I, in fact, I can. Can you still see my screen? Okay, or I stop sharing my screen. I you stop sharing, but okay. I'll stop. Yeah, I can can quickly quickly show yeah, that. Some people say that they are you know, they are. Yeah. Can you can you can you see the screen? Yeah, okay? we can see it now. Yeah. yeah okay, let me just see. I can just quickly go back and show you the one the one the one case that I have there. Um, here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the one. This is the case here. You can you, you can see here, Mateus. This is the case here. You can see here. It's, it's two catheters through the superior social sinus into the cavernous sinus. Yes, yeah, right. But I but I but also said it didn't work. Unfortunately, in this case, I ended up sacrificing the carotid. So this is sometimes what happens. You know, you try to go that route, and you you know, I, I think now the fly verters and other things maybe is, is is better. But this is like an earlier case. So okay, uh, there are a few few you know reports and papers uh, especially from the jefferson group there's a review on uh, off-label use of flow diverters where they mentioned the flow diverters for cc fistulas and uh, you mentioned that you had some experience with it and especially to protect the carotid have you used multiple flow diverters like stacked no i i I think, I mean, in my mind, the 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 the, the cure treatment comes from a transvenous embolization. Like this, this dent in the carotid is really to to add some flow averting uh, effect to it, to allow to give a scaffold for healing. You know, to uh, to protect the carotid. It's not, you know, I I don't I don't think stacking the the these dents. You know, they're expensive. I mean, stacking these dents and carotid is really going to cure this. I mean. I mean, we'll be here interested to hear what Dr. McDougall's experience is too. I mean, do you I I mean I, I don't think stacking yeah. stents is gonna help. I I inherited one of those cases uh with <laughs> with the it had, had some transvenous coiling and then then flow diverters placed after and fissure was still there. It was just it just became an enormously difficult problem. Uh ultimately cured transarterial onyx. Uh, but it was it was yeah, I, the the trouble is you're committing to antiplatelets, uh, so you're not, you know, uh, with the flow diverter. Uh, and if it doesn't cure the fistula, then then you're, it's, it's a real difficult problem. So, so Dr. McGill, would, would you say that? So, uh, so for the direct fistula, you know, so I so I so I show a couple of cases. And and before before I use the flow diverter, I used to just put a balloon at across the rent, you know, and I just do transvenous coiling that way. That that's my preferred treatment. And yeah. I and, and if I can cure it that way, uh, I will. If, if I can, then I sacrifice a carotid. That, that's what I used to do. But now with the FD, I just put the FD in, and I one FD, and then I do transvenous coiling. I do like. I mean, do you do you think even that is too aggressive, or should we just do just balloon and and I mean, just because to your point that, that the problem is that if if you if you don't get it, then you're on the antiplatelet therapy. It makes it makes everything more complex. But I. But I do think maybe there is there is some benefit of that too. So I, I just don't know where the balance is. I would like to hear kind of your 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 thoughts on that. Yeah, I I, I think that um, you know, fortunately those cases are relatively rare. Uh, you know, you want to know ahead of time 
are, do you have the option of sacrificing the carotid first of all you know uh, so that's that's always important to know and then um you know if you can preserve the carotid that's a big win so i so i'm certainly in favor of that i think i think it probably is better to have something temporary uh that that you can change later like like a balloon or like a, a retrievable stand or something to, to protect you while you're coiling just so you, so you don't get coils in the carotid again visibility becomes hard as you pack the the coils around there oh maybe um, maybe you said so, yeah sorry Ken. Yeah. so i think so i think i mean i think there's there's trade-offs i mean the nice the float of her is certainly a nice way to protect the vessel um and and you know and the, you always have the bailout of closing the carotid if, if they pass the test occlusion or you know if 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 you have a big direct fission you're not seeing any intracranial circulation you know, obviously they've already passed the test occlusion if they're if they're still intact so um I, if you can save the carotid with the floater rotor i'm certainly not opposed to that but i think you, you just need to be really thoughtful about you know what your plan b is sure okay uh one more question how often do you see these uh, cc fistulas that present with ichs i mean i have seen just a few in the literature, you know, these ones that drain posterior and have you seen only that case or you, you have seen more? I mean, I show one, I show one case here, you know, uh, that, that from venous spherex, like a hemorrhage, I've, it's pretty rare, but I, but I've seen more than one case. I mean, I, I, I think of course the most common symptoms is the ophthalmologic symptoms, you know, but I, I I've seen a few cases with, with intracerebral hemorrhage. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's just, you know, a function of, of uh, what, outflow pathways um the thrombose because you know you see patients thrombose their uh, superior inferior ophthalmic veins and everything get redirected posterior and those are the ones that bleed and you so it's not it's it's a less common presentation because the cavernous sinus is so you know rich in the way that that there's egress for the venous blood but but if if those pathways thrombose then certainly they can be just like any other high risk uh, dural fistula right we have a few questions from the chat now. Uh, one of them is uh, if you've had ever experienced a trigeminal cardiac reflex with, uh, with a DMSO on the cavernous sinus? No. No. And the second one is you spoke about radio surgery, but yeah. if you had to, what is your experience uh, or you had any cases sent to? I, I mean, I've actually never done it. Talking with you, have you ever treated one radio surgery? I've never treated CC for radio surgery. Like I know the literature is out there, but I, I've never done it. In in my very first few years of, of uh, practice, I treated, I sent one for radio surgery and I regret that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think a take home message is this for the trainees that I, I I think you know radio surgery is really the last last resort. Like you try everything else, nothing works, and you you must treat this fish for whatever reason. I think that's probably reasonable. But so but I think certainly transvenous, you know, the the the, the transvenous safe transvenous coronalization route should be the consideration. I think to Dr. Madugo's point also was who needs treatment. You know, I I I, I think you know I mean. I think it's it's fair fair to say someone has some mild ophthalmologic symptoms with no visual loss and no intraocular pressure increase can can be watched potentially. I have a, a question from for myself also. Uh, how, I mean, after diagnosis of a direct of type A, barrow A, uh, how long you wait to treat? I mean, you do it as soon as possible, or I mean, what is your maximal waiting time? I mean, I don't think it's the right. I mean, it's it's just it's the same thing. I, I think if people don't have visual loss and they don't have, you know, they don't have severe high intraocular pressure, you don't have to treat them emergently. But I usually I I I try to treat them relatively expediently. I I don't come in the middle of the night to do them, or doesn't mean you know done maybe first thing tomorrow. But I think I, I usually treat it fairly quickly. But you know, but as but I but I think you know if they don't have those those problems, like I mean, the first case I showed like the the, the, the the, the young man came back two years later and I mean, and his symptoms are fairly mild actually, you know, two years after the accident and he has a bit of a swollen eye and his aqua pressure a little bit high, but not, but not terrible. So even after two years there, there could be okay. How about, how about, how about you guys talking with Hugo? How, how often do you, do you treat the yeah. red fish when you see them? Yeah, no, I would, I mean, if they're coming to the, you know, the ED with a, you know, after a car accident or the rare aneurysm that's ruptured, I mean, I'm, I'm going to treat them that hospitalization, but it, like you say, if the eye is not at risk, the intraocular pressures aren't through the roof, then then there's no, it's not an emergency. Yeah. 
okay uh, that that's all i got uh, so thank you so much for your no. presence here dr gani was amazing really you know no, thanks. Thank you, everyone. I, I guess I'll, I'll just make one final uh, technical point. So since, since I know there is there's a lot of trainees on the on the audience, is that it happens to me before. I said the, the, these are the, the things that I regret in training these these cases. So I think one thing is when you get the access to the to the to the point of visualization, right? Like Dr. Gill said, it takes hours sometimes to get there, right? And you have to really make sure that you densely pack that. Like I mean. When I first doing it, you know, you take a long time to get there. You you got there and you just get kind of relaxed and you pack it. Because what happens if you don't get it completely? One, there's no other, then you lock your access. So like the last case I showed, right? If you don't pack it completely, you lose the access. And and then to so lose the access, so there's no really easy way to treat the fish. And secondly, you the symptoms can get way worse. I mean, you you don't, you know, like you like you like you lock out, for example, like you lock out one one part of fistula and then draining through the eye. And now you're having cortical venous reflux, like Dr. McDougall was saying. So I, so I think, so I, so I always tell myself that now I do this case, when I get the chance, when you're there, you get the chance, take the time to really close that well and close that along with the, the draining veins, the proximal the draining veins. So close all that well, so that one, it, you know, it, the fistula is closed. And secondly, you're not going to redirect flow. You know, I mean, I, I, I think because because if you, if you don't do it right, one, you, you, you lose the opportunity. And secondly, you can actually make it worse. So I think that's, that's, the, that's an important, I think, learning point from doing these cases. Yeah, great, great points. It never gets easier than the first time. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. So I really, yeah. really appreciate that. Have a, have a good morning and happy New Year. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Really enjoyed it and great seeing you. You take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.